This evening is James 1, verse 9. I was thinking about trying to deal with verses 10 and 11 as well, where he talks about the rich man, but uh, it, it just turned out to be too much. So I'm, I'm going to just deal with the, the first trial, which is the trial of financial hardship. But um, sorry to give you this at the last minute, BJ, but even if it's not on the screen, I'd just like to read verses 9, 10, and 11. So James writes this, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. And the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and its flower falls off, and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Well, uh, this evening we're going to look just at the first part of that. Okay. So James has, has shown us so far that we should rejoice. Okay, and what he means by that is be glad and actually celebrate. Okay, celebrate when the Lord sends trials. I wonder how often we actually respond to trials in that way, but that's the way that James tells us we should not because of the trials themselves, because those trials are very difficult to go through, but because of the good that the Lord actually intends to bring through those trials. We, we know, we've seen that He uses them to expose weakness, you know, our weaknesses. Uh, not to shame us, but to, to really zero in or, or to show us what it is He's going to deal with in our lives what it is He wants to strengthen because He wants to work endurance in us, uh, the endurance that we need to, to stick with Him, to, to trust Him through the difficult times and to stay on the right path, even though it may be difficult, to help us to grow strong so that we can stand against the things that, that really are our enemies, our adversaries that get in our way and try to get us off the path. Uh, that would be, of course, uh, the world, the flesh, and the devil, and any of those things uh, we are liable to. God wants to give us grace and strength against that. So in short, the Lord uses trials to make us more like Jesus. You know, He's using them to refine us, really to, to get us to love our lives in this world less and to love uh, that life which He has given to us forever in heaven more. Now, the author to the Hebrews tells us that, that this is how the Father actually trained His own Son. This is how He trained Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, He says in chapter 5, verse 8, although He was a Son, He learned obedience from the things which He suffered. So, the Father put Jesus through suffering, through trials, and Jesus learned through those things to honor His Father. He learned obedience. It's hard to think about Jesus learning anything, but we do know that He did, and He responded properly in every situation. We know He did that in order to be a sympathetic high priest for us so that He knows how to come to our aid when we're going through uh, similar things, but He also did this as an example to us. Now, we know that as the children of God, which we are, that God is going to do, as, as our Heavenly Father, He's going to do the same thing for us. We should expect Him to train us through trials. Now, James also told us what to do during a trial. You know, we don't often know how to use trials in the way that we should, so we should ask God for the wisdom to make the best use of it, remembering that He sent it for a purpose. We need His help to realize what that purpose is. Uh, you know, it, it's one thing to know God's truth. It's one thing to know principles, but it's still another thing that you know quite well actually to apply those principles to the situations that we have to face. But that's what wisdom is all about. That's what the trial is meant to do is to help us take the truth and apply it to our situations so that we can honor and glorify God in it and help one another do the same. Now, we often lack that, we saw, because we don't spend enough time in the Word, studying the Word, meditating on the Word, because, you know, God not only shows us the principles in the Word, but He also shows us how to apply them. He tells us how to apply them, and He also gives us examples 
of how to apply them. So we need to study the Word of God. That's, that's our source. Uh, we don't have this skill because we're inexperienced. You know, there's still a lot that we haven't gone through. There's still a much that we have to learn. One of my professors in college talked about something that uh, we perhaps know a lot about by this time, and that is in every phase of life, there are new things that we're going to be exposed to that are going to be trials, that are going to be, you know, temptations for us. Uh, when we're younger, there are certain things. When we're older, there are certain other things. You know, uh, as far as when you get older, there's health, there's, there's finances, there's things that we don't think about so much when we're younger. So new things, inexperience. You know, there's new things to learn at every stage of life. We haven't gone through it all yet. But then James pointed out one other reason why we lack the wisdom, and that's because we don't ask. We don't ask as we should. James encourages us, he actually commands us, that when we're going through the trial, we must ask God for wisdom. And if we do, he says, God has promised to give it to us. He'll not only give us what we need, but he'll give us more than we need. And unlike perhaps you know, earthly counselors, perhaps even our own parents, he's, he's not going to reproach us. He's not going to scold us. He's not going to belittle us because we don't know what we're supposed to do. But he will receive us and he will teach us and he wants us to come. And he says he will not reproach us for it. But James also reminded us that we need to ask in faith. We need to believe that he will give us what he promised that he would give us. And he has promised to give us wisdom. So when we ask, we can know that he will do it. And then, of course, the last thing we saw is we need to look to see how God's going to reveal it to us. He will in his word. He will maybe through counselors. But we also saw he may do it through circumstances, though we have to be very cautious when it comes to that because we can very easily misread providence, though um, we're not as apt perhaps to misread um, what God says in his word. Well, from this, James now moves on to deal with two trials in particular. That of financial hardship and that of financial prosperity. And these are themes that James will actually deal with uh, a couple of times. You know, he'll return to the same several times in, in his letter. Now we can see how hardship, financial hardship can be a trial, but the same thing can be true of having an abundance. Uh, we actually aren't gonna look at both of those this evening, but we will see something of both this evening. Now, I've already read for you what Eger, who's one of the authors of the, of the book of Proverbs, tells us uh, in his prayer, and let me read it again. Two things I have asked of you. Do not refuse me before I die. Keep deception and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion that I not be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. Now, James, I believe in his letter, reflects these same distinctions. He speaks of the poor, he speaks of the rich, and then I think he also speaks of those with the food that is their portion who have what the Lord knows they can handle. But this evening, as I've already said, I want us to consider the poor. And I, I want us to consider first what James is referring to here by humble circumstances, what it means to be a brother of humble circumstances. And then secondly, how the Lord uses that particular trial to bring blessing. So first of all, what does he mean by a brother of humble circumstances? Well, A.T. Robertson tells us that this word that's translated here, humble circumstances, refers to the lowly in outward condition, humble and poor, uh, not the spiritually humble. Okay, so not the inward humility, but uh, outward humbling uh, circumstances. So James is not speaking here 
uh, of what Jesus is speaking about in the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about the poor in spirit and how blessed they are because theirs is the, uh, the kingdom of heaven, okay? That's not what he's referring to. That is true, you know, what Jesus says obviously is true. If we humble ourselves, if we empty ourselves of our self-righteousness and, and any merit in the sight of God and trust in Jesus alone, we will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but that is to be poor inwardly, okay? James here is speaking about being poor outwardly, and he's talking about it in the context of trials, okay? In this case, the trials that come to those who have little. Now, again, I said he's going to allude to this particular trial uh, again in his letter, such as where he speaks about the destitution of orphans and widows. They are those who have, you know, that are brothers and sisters, so to speak, of humble circumstances. They're perhaps the most humble of mankind. And he'll also speak about how the poor are often treated in the assemblies. And, of course, James will rebuke them for it because, you know, whereas they treat the rich as guests of honor, they treat the poor uh, very poorly. <laughs> Uh, maybe it's because they um, view them as someone who is a burden, uh, as secondhand citizens in the kingdom of heaven. And again, that's perhaps one of the trials that come upon those who are poor or in humble circumstances. Now, I don't think any of us are currently in that category, okay? We may not be rich, but we're not necessarily impoverished. On the other hand, we, we sort of fall into that middle group, I think. You know, we're, we're called the middle class uh, for a reason. Uh, we don't have a great deal of surplus, but we do have some. Our needs are met, and we have perhaps more than we need for our basic necessities. But though that is true, I think perhaps we have, at some time in our lives, maybe we've experienced something of what this is like, so we can sort of enter into this trial. You know, how can we benefit from this if we're not going through it right now? Well, again, maybe we, we have been through it before. And I was thinking about maybe, I don't know, some of the circumstances that may have led to this. Um, maybe um, some of us, we uh, moved out of our parents' house when we were young because we couldn't, uh, we maybe didn't want to, to stay there any longer. And when we did, we found out things were a little bit harder outside than we thought they would be. And uh, maybe we, we were in want, or maybe we went to college and um, we had to pay for it ourselves. We didn't have parents to pay the bill for us, and, and we became the quote-unquote starving students. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen the, uh, the moving company. It was called Starving Students. I think they probably got rich on that. But um, anyway, but the idea is, if, you know, you're, you're pretty desperate for funds when you're in college. You don't have a lot. One of my college professors um, said in his college days that things were so tight for him and his wife, sometimes all they had to eat were, was popcorn or maybe just potatoes, and that's it. And the only reason they had that was because some generous soul at the church they were going to dropped off a 10-pound bag of potatoes or, or maybe a 5-pound uh, bag of popcorn. Uh, they, things were very, uh, you know, lean for them during that time. You know, when Donna and I went to college, uh, we, you know, we had, it wasn't, you know, lavish by any means. We, we had to pay our own way. But things were tight. Uh, you know, tight so if, if we wanted to go out, I mean, if we wanted to splurge, we'd go to Taco Bell. That was kind of the, you know, the, the height. We kind of looked forward to that. But the only way we could afford to do it was by collecting aluminum cans. So, you know, we know a little bit about that, but we still had, you know, a place to live and we had, you know, food to eat and so forth. And I think about our Shirley sister, Nicolay, who's um, told us, uh, I'm sure you've, you've heard her um, story of what it was like growing up in uh, Holland uh, under Nazi-occupied, uh, you know, a Nazi-occupied country. Uh, things would have been hard enough in those days, as we know, because, I mean, those were the days just outside of the Depression uh, without the Germans coming and taking whatever it is they wanted, whenever they wanted, you know, that made things difficult for them. My mother's parents often went without food during the Great Depression so that they could give their children 
something to eat, and that might just be a large sandwich, you know, or it could be a sugar sandwich. Uh, there, there really wasn't, wasn't much. But you see, not having very much can be a trial, right? It, it makes things difficult. It, it causes stress. It makes us stress about and wonder about, are we going to have enough to eat or are we going to starve to death? Are we going to end up on the street? Are we going to have a place to live? And of course, as the years go by, one of the other concerns we, we often run into is, are we going to have enough to retire? You know, to make it to the end of our lives when we're no longer able to work, is there going to be enough? Being poor can present us with new temptations, okay? Um, such as Eger reflects in his prayer uh, to take what doesn't belong to us. He says, you know, uh, don't, don't let me be in want or in poverty so that I might steal and profane the name of my God. You know, some of you here are familiar with the, um, the, uh, the, the book, and it's also been made into a movie at least three times, uh, Les Miserables, how Jean Valjean, you know, was, was starving. And it was up to him to provide for his widowed sister and her seven children. And how not being able to find work, not being able to get food, drove him to do something he would otherwise never have done. He stole a loaf of bread to save them, only to be caught and unjustly sentenced to seven years of hard labor in prison. Something very unjust. The point is, humble circumstances can be a trial, right? But James wants us to know that it can also be a, a blessing. He says those of humble circumstances should glory in their high position. Now remember, I've already mentioned this once before, but he said in verse 5, if we lack wisdom, we must ask of God. He said, Actually, he's commanding us to do that. You know, that is, you, you must do that or let him ask of God. That's actually a command. And here he's, he's giving us another command, that the brother or sister of humble circumstances, that the poor should glory in their high position. They should rejoice. They should be glad. They should even boast about their poverty. Um, because ultimately, James says, they, they have a high position. Now, he's either referring to their current situation or in what that situation would actually lead them to in God's kingdom. Now, we need to remember that James here is addressing a particular trial. And remember, the trials are meant for our good. And the trial should make us rejoice, count it all joy, you know, celebrate when you're involved in a trial. So what is it that they are to celebrate in this particular trial? What is it that the poor are to celebrate? Well, for one thing, um, James tells us that God has chosen to give the poor uh, a, a greater faith. Now, not to all the poor, but to more poor than rich, okay? And it's faith that gives us the true riches. It's faith that gives us God's kingdom. James will tell us in chapter 2, verse 5, Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? And then Jesus says something very similar in Luke 6, verse, verse 20, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom uh, of heaven. Now, for one thing, what, what James is telling us and what Jesus is telling us is, in fact, God does give faith more to the poor than he does to the rich, because poor see more of their need of him. But giving faith to the poor means that they will receive something even greater than the riches that are in this world, okay? Now, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking about something that I had understood before, 
from the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And in an explanation, I, I heard of this, I believe it was by Jonathan Edwards. Again, I just want to give credit to whom credit is due. And it's the idea that God has an inheritance for, for all of his children, okay? And, and everyone is his children, or are his children. Um, the poor believers receive their inheritance in heaven, whereas the rich unbelievers receive their inheritance here. And I believe it's, it's really what Jesus is saying, as I said in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, when Abraham was explaining to the rich man why he was suffering and why Lazarus was being comforted. He says this in Luke 16, 22. Child, remember that during your life, you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, bad things. You were rich, he was poor. I mean, Lazarus was impoverished. He was the one scraping, begging for crumbs that fell from the rich man's table, and he wasn't receiving anything. But now he, that is Lazarus, is being comforted here, and you are in agony. So you receive your good things in this life. Lazarus is receiving his good things in the life to come. Now, as I just mentioned, there is a sense in which all mankind are God's children. Remember what Paul said to the philosophers on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 28 and 29, for in him... We live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. And then Paul says, being then the children of God, and that applies to all of us here, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. We are all God's children. And God gives to each of his children an inheritance. We don't often think in those terms. You know, with regard to the unbelievers of the world, we certainly do with regard to believers. But he has an inheritance for all of his children. Some of them receive it in this life, like the rich man. And some in the life to come, like Lazarus. And if I were to ask you, which would you prefer? <laughs> well, Lazarus received the better inheritance because it's one that he gets to keep forever, much longer than the rich man. You know, those who are rich in this world one day have to give up the riches. Remember what, what the uh, psalmist says in Psalm 73, how he was envious of the wicked because they were rich and how they, they were fat and they didn't have any pains in their death and they're always at ease and yet he's, you know, disciplined every day. Things are going hard for him. It's kind of like the rich man and Lazarus and he almost stumbled until he came to the house of God and saw what was going to happen to them and then realize what was going to happen to him. You see, it doesn't matter, as Jonathan Edwards said, it doesn't matter who prospers in this world. What matters is who prospers in the world to come. So those who have less, I think this is the point that James is making, those who have less are motivated to trust God more. They have to look out of themselves to something else. It reminds me of uh, the time that Again, Don and I, when we were part of Calvary Chapel years ago, we used to do street evangelism as a part of our home fellowship group, and we went to different parts of town, some affluent parts and, and some down and out parts. And the affluent parts, the people wouldn't give us the time of day. We had a very difficult time talking to them about the gospel. They didn't see a need. They had everything they wanted, everything they needed. But in those places where people were down and out, they talked to us quite a bit because they saw their need. Those who have less are more motivated to look to God. Our circumstances can push us towards Him. Now that is the blessing of this particular trial. But I wanted to, um, you know, and, well again, okay, we may have experienced some of that and we may know what that's like during those times we had hardships. Maybe it forced us to look to the Lord more. But I think we can benefit from this as well by understanding that um, trusting God is something we should do, regardless of what we have, okay? Uh, even if we think we have enough to meet all of our needs. And we really need to ask ourselves the question this evening, is, is that what we're doing? Are we looking to God? 
Are we looking to God for our, our food, for our covering, for our shelter? Are we looking to Him to take care of us to the end of our days? Or are we looking to our monetary resources? You know, our bank accounts, our investments, our pensions, our Social Security insurance. You know, even if they appear to be enough, even if it seems like they're enough, we cannot trust them. The reason is because wealth is transient. We can't rely on it. You know, at one, especially in this economy, right? In, at one moment, you might think you, you've got enough and you're tempted to say, okay, I can rest, kind of like the rich man. My barns are full and I, I can just take my ease. But then the economy shifts and suddenly what you have is worth so much less and you begin to wonder, oh, am I going to make it to the end? Well, it just proves what Solomon tells us in Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. He says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. Isn't that interesting coming from Solomon, who was the wealthiest man probably who ever lived. Why? He says, when you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Wealth is transient. You know, Jesus warns us in the Sermon on the Mount not to store up our treasures on earth for that very reason because he said, first of all, our possessions can disintegrate. They can, they can rust. Uh, the moth can, can eat them up. The second law of thermodynamics is, is still in operation. It's turning everything into dust. That fancy car, you know, one day is going to get all rusted. That house is going to become dilapidated. And he says, our money can be stolen. We know, again, the economy could collapse. During the Great Depression, the banks closed. The money disappeared. Okay? God needs to be our hope. He needs to be our security, not our money. Now, the fact that we can't depend on our money means that we can't depend on what we have. We need to depend on the Lord, okay? And the fact that we need to depend on the Lord should have another effect on us. It should humble us. It should make us like those of humble circumstances. You know, the rich, remember how, again, the psalmist in Psalm 73 described the rich, the wicked, they're, they're proud, they're arrogant. Uh, they think they've got everything that they need. But the poor are humble. Those who are dependent on the Lord are, are humble. And humility can give us another blessing. Humility is the way to greatness in God's kingdom. Okay? So when we realize that we, we, we don't have what we, we need, or even if we think we have what we need, it's not going to be enough because it could be taken away, and that causes us to depend on the Lord, which is why we should depend on Him. That should humble us. Humility paves the way to greatness. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who's going to have the place of greatest honor? And that's really the reward, isn't it? Places of honor. And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children... You will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now again, I don't think that Jesus was saying that was true of all children. I don't think that there was a particular child who was converted, who happened to be very humble, that he could just grab and use as an example. But I think he was talking about, again, the childlike humility how a child depends on, on their parents for everything. We're talking about an age where they actually do that. Um, that they trust you, that they, they depend on you, uh, that they are humble. We have to become that way, to have that childlike trust in the Lord, even to enter into the kingdom of heaven, which is what the Lord gives to us through His Holy Spirit. But we also need this kind of humility to be great because humility enables us to put aside our own needs, our own concerns, and to serve others in the way that Jesus served others. Jesus also said in Mark 10, verses 42 through 45, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you 
shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Remember when Jesus talked about um, how among those born of men there is arisen none greater than John the Baptist, right? He is, he is the greatest because he had humbled himself, uh, gave up the world, had very, um, I guess, uncomfortable clothing, and was eating locusts and wild honey in the wilderness, and and, and serving the Lord. I mean, he, he gave up the world in order just to serve the Lord. But then Jesus goes on to say, yet he who is least in the kingdom is greater than he. Now, he didn't mean by that. I don't think he meant by that, that, that John the Baptist was an Old Testament prophet and he may have been a great Old Testament prophet, but everybody who actually trusts in Jesus and who's a part of the new covenant is greater than the greatest of the old covenant prophets. I, I don't think so. I don't think... New Covenant believers are any greater than Old Covenant believers because we're all saved by Christ and we're all in the, in the kingdom. So what did Jesus mean by the one who is least is greater than he? Well, he was referring to himself. He's the one who made himself least in the kingdom, even as he said. He didn't come to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life, to give his life a ransom for many. And then he says, if you would be great in the kingdom, you need to do exactly the same thing. You need to humble yourself and serve the Lord. And when you do that, then you gain the true riches. And again, let's not forget that the reward we get for serving Him is something that we get to keep forever, unlike the treasures of this world. So, uh, trusting in the Lord, um, not our riches, leads to a certain kind of humility that leads to a servanthood or a service that brings about a greater reward for us. And again, that's one way we can benefit. But thirdly, a, a stronger trust in God's provision will also give to us a contentedness, okay, with, with less. I think about Paul, what Paul says in Philippians 4, verses 12 through 13. He says, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. When you have the Lord, you have something that satisfies you, even if you are a, a, you know, a, a believer who is impoverished. And Paul says there were times that he was impoverished, but he had everything he needed. He, he's learned how to live in those circumstances because no one can take away from him his greatest treasure, and that is the Lord. And then finally, knowing that the kingdom is, is ours can also make us more thankful. You know, having Christ can make us more thankful for the little that we actually do have in this life. As Spurgeon once said this, I heard the story in another context, but I'll just, I'll just assume that Spurgeon has given us the, the, uh, the original story. He says, I have heard of some good old woman in a cottage who had nothing but a piece of bread and a little water, and lifting up her hands, she said as a blessing, what, all this, and Christ too? If we have Christ, even the little we have is going to seem like a feast because, again, we have the true riches. So again, Humble circumstances are definitely a trial, but the Lord can turn that trial into a blessing in the many ways in which we've seen. We just simply need to learn to trust Him and to, put our, uh, to make Him our riches, to see what the true riches are, not the things of this world, but the things of heaven. So may the Lord give us um, the grace to do that. Let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask for his, uh, his mercy.